Welcome to Facing the Canon. My guest on the program is Bishop Jill Duff, author of Lighting the Beacons. Bishop Jill, welcome to Facing the Canon. Very good to be here. Thank you so much. Well, let's go back. When you were four, you went to your local primary school and you saw pictures of Jesus mm -hmm. and, then, and then you had dreams about him. Yeah, I did. I did. In some ways, I'm a Church of England success story because it was our, just our local Church of England primary school in Bolton. And um, I saw the pictures of him on the wall had dreams, and in the dream I was involved in a rescue. And when you're four, you don't normally get asked to be involved in any rescue. So that made quite an impression on me. And so um, growing up at that school, I was given a Bible, started going to Sunday school, and started reading the stories of Jesus and was really, you know, intrigued by him, actually. Yeah. But, but you can remember when you were four I having do. those vivid dreams. I do, actually. And I do wonder whether we sort of don't realise how much children are aware of at a very early age. And in fact, I think we get deafer as we go, go on. So as you maybe know, I'm um, chair of New Wine. And um, a few years ago, we had problems in uh, pebbles, which is our three to fours, because one of the little boys is getting quite upset. And we thought it was because he had a new brother and was jealous. But eventually he managed to communicate that he was really upset with his brother because his brother wouldn't tell him uh, what Jesus was like and he was starting to forget. How Isn't that lovely? That is beautiful. Mm. Now, when you were 11, you mm. went to a, a camp, yeah, a Christian yeah. camp, Absolutely. and you had an experience there. Yes, yes, I, it was a, you know, activity camp of all sorts, and it's my first time away from home. Um, and um, my leader said to me, have you ever heard of the Holy Spirit? So I said, well, not really, I've heard of God, the Father, heard of Jesus, I've never heard of the Holy Spirit. And she just said, well, don't read the Bible like it's a normal book. Ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. So I did. And it was literally like Jesus walked off the page of the Bible and into my life like a real and living person. And I remember going um, to meet my mum at Manchester Piccadilly Station. Um, and I banded up to her and said, mum, I've given my life to Jesus. <laughs> she was completely horrified. <laughs> and your mother thought you were brainwashed. She thought I was brainwashed by the Church of England, which actually carried on for most of her life, really. But just to finish her story was um, about 10 years ago now, I went to see her and she was in a hospice in Manchester because she got cancer. And when I got there, she said to me, you've got to come along the corridor with me to the chapel. I thought, that's a very funny thing for my mum to say. So I went with her to the chapel. And she said, I was here last night and I was asking God to make my back better because she had a bad back with a cancer. And she said, it was like Jesus was here and he was telling me it's going to be OK. She said, that's what you've been trying to tell me all these years, isn't it? And I'm not quite sure what happened to that night, but I do know that we were from a family of worriers. So if we could worry about something, we'd worry about it. But she approached her death um, four months late on Easter Day. On Easter Day. With a beautiful sense of peace. Yeah. And that gives you great confidence that she was promoted to glory. I, I believe so, yeah, yes. as far as I can know, yeah. Wow. <laughs> you, you went off to Cambridge University. Yes. That's, you studied natural sciences. Yes. And then you went to Oxford and studied chemistry. The PhD in chemistry, In yes. chemistry. Yeah. And then where did that lead you to? And that led me to working um, for ESSO in the oil industry. Um, I did research and then management. Um, and I really enjoyed that, actually. That was a really um, good part of my career, I suppose, yeah. And you met your husband when you were students at Cambridge. Him, that's right, yes, Jeremy. And, a and um, he ended up getting ordained and... He, he uh, after me, actually, get, getting ordained in his um, uh, in, uh, late 20s, early 30s. But yes, yeah, he came to Cape Oxford and did a PhD in New Testament. So his expertise at that time was in... Um, writing in a false name, and he also wrote a Greek textbook. That's how he's known. So often I'll go to places and I'll be introduced as the Bishop of Lancaster, and people will say, oh, I recognise you. Um, you're married to Jeremy Duff, aren't yes. you? Because his textbook has really travelled. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, but then, um, so 
in your journey of faith, mm. uh, you were members of a local church, and I gather your husband said to you, you know, what do you want to do? Yeah, that's, yeah. And, and you said, I want to be a vicar. Uh, yeah, exactly. We were, we were at St Matthew's in Oxford, and, you know, very much a sort of Church of England passion for local community. And he said, what do you dream of doing? And um, I thought, I'd love to be a vicar, but I want to put it off till I'm in my 50s when I've had kids, more time. And that was the plan, really. But my dad, um, short, not long after that, he, he died and he was in his 50s. And it was a bit of a wake up call because, I, you know, you can put things off um, later. And so I did then go forward for ordination, um, the training of the Church of England when I was 27, ordained at age 30. And you worked in some fascinating, uh, what we'd say, use the word parishes in Liverpool. Yes, absolutely. Tell, tell us about some of those. Yes, well, well, during my time training, we had this um, inner city work experience in London. And I just loved it. People were so open to the gospel. It was like cross-cultural work, which I was really interested in because um, um, some of my friends had gone, gone abroad as cross-cultural missionaries. And how you put a gospel in a different culture intrigued me. So when it came to be ordains and serve what's called a curacy, like an apprenticeship. Um, I look for places that would offer uh, for more poorer backgrounds So moved to a council state in Liverpool. I thought it wouldn't be a culture shock, but it was. <laughs> yes. um, and um, um, my husband's originally from Liverpool and it was incredible meeting people um, whose lives in some ways have been so um, challenged by pain. And yet when Jesus moved in, it's like he would excavate that pain and it would allow almost deeper cavities for the work of God. So I met women, you know, who were just a bit older than me, who'd had, you know, kids at 16, all sorts of abuse stories, lots of challenging stuff, and yet were so open um, to the work of God. I found that really um, very moving. There's one story that I read about um, when you um, went out one evening and you met a group of girls. Oh, the, yeah, the, yeah. Um, yes. Tell us what happened that there. That was a bit later on in the story. Yes. So we, we were, li all my parish ministry has been in, in, in Liverpool Diocese, but this is in Widnes. Yes. And where, my husband by the time was a vicar, and where we lived, um, uh, the vicarage was in the old, the town centre, but um, it had kind of degenerated so that it was now surrounded not by the, the lovely Victorian town hall had been turned into a nightclub and there was eight other nightclubs, which was quite noisy because they had a four o'clock in the morning licence. Um, so it was quite noisy on a Friday just at night. But the plus side was there was lots of takeaways. So it's a Friday night in, in February, quite dark. I was just crossing from my house to get my takeaway curry. I bumped into these three girls on the street. And they were about 13, 14. I said, you know, what are you doing out at, at night? Because you know, it was seven o'clock, it was dark. And they said, oh, well, mum's at bingo, we can't go home, and Chloe's been kicked out of school. So I thought, gosh, I want to do something for you, really, but I couldn't think what to do. I said, well, can I pray for you? So I, I basically prayed that Chloe would get back into school and uh, that they would encounter the peace of God. And when I like, opened my eyes, <laughs> um, uh, looked up, they were like meerkats. The heads were up, and like there was this sort of, atmosphere shift you know there was a sense of the peace of yeah, God yeah and you could feel that I could feel that but I think they could too so they said well where do you live I said well I live in that vicarage there and we have a service on a Sunday you know afternoon that's kind of uh, all ages and stages you know come along and I thought that was the last I'd hear of them so next Sunday comes along and because I'm the vicar's wife at that point I'm doing the children's work in this small little room kids from five to eleven on emergency chairs all sorts of different stages very rubbish children's work and we were looking at the story of um of Zacchaeus meeting Jesus, you know, and, you know, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And then these three girls, like, march in. I think, oh, no, this is so, like, not teenage appropriate. No, it's... So, it's, so I was like, oh, well, um, we're doing this story about um, Jesus, for you, you know, asking Z this uh, uh, blind man what he'd like to do for him, you know. So would you like to do a picture of what you'd like Jesus to do for you? Thinking, I'm stuck here. So the first one, like, flicks the hair grabs a pen and goes, I want Jesus to give me one pound 20. <laughs> and then the next one like mutinies and does the same thing. And they all write on a piece of paper, I want Jesus to give me one pound 20. And then they go, huh, this is so boring. Flick the hair and then march off. And I think, oh, that was and such a like lost one opportunity. One pound 20, and it's quite specific. It was it quite specific. It wasn't one pound or two pound. <laughs> no, one pound I don't 20. know what, it was on one pound 20. Anyway. Yes. Um, uh, 
So it turns out that that evening they were, they were walking along the street in witness. A tramp crossed the road, shoved some money in their hands, £3.60. So next Sunday, they, they arrive back in church. Chloe's back in school and she's brought her boyfriend with her. And the boyfriend says, huh, this is so boring. And Chloe goes, well, she prays and stuff happens. <laughs> But that's it, though, isn't it, Jill? We pray and stuff happens. Absolutely. And it's we know the thing. truth of that, don't we? When we pray, coincidences happen. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Were you surprised when you were invited to be a bishop? Uh, yes, I was. I, I hid from it quite a lot. In fact, my husband said, so when they asked me, you have to be asked to be a bishop yes. or asked to apply to be a bishop. And I yes. just said no. And so my husband said, well, don't you think you should pray about it? Yes. <laughs> so, um, so I prayed about it and went to see the kind of the bishop in charge. And I kind of told him all the reasons he shouldn't appoint me, really, in a very sort of, you know, female approach to career ambition. And so he didn't shortlist me. But the um, the sense of call to Lancashire, because I'm from Lancashire, um, and Lancaster actually didn't go away. So about. Um, about a month later, I woke up one morning, I thought, I know I'll email this bishop and say, I know you've appointed the Bishop of Lancaster, but you know, if there's any roles down the line in mission evangelism, because that's my passion, yes. um, like yours, um, then let me know. And I thought, I can't send that email, it's so pushy. So I left it in my inbox and literally three hours later, he phoned me and he said, we've shortlisted from 28, we've interviewed four people, I've turned them all down, would you consider applying? And so my biggest objection was how I would do this by, while being a wife and a mum. Yes. Because my boys weren't, you know, nine and 12 at the time. And the next day I was digging in the snow with Harry, who was then nine. And he said out of the blue, mummy, um, who's going to do your job when you leave it? <laughs> so that felt like the sort of, sometimes God gives us broadband Absolutely. callings. Not always, but that was, a, it was definitely a broadband um, lights on the runway route into being the Bishop of Lancaster. Well, I, Killian and I often say the Lord guides our steps and he guides our stops. Mm. And actually it's a good prayer yeah. to pray, isn't it, Lord? Guide them yes. and, and show us when we should stop. Yeah. But you were appointed a bishop and you oversee how many churches? So there's a hundred and, um, there was 235 parishes. Yes. Um, um, 190 schools and quite a number of chaplaincies, so prison chaplains and hospital chaplaincies as well. So with a colleague, um, sure. uh, Philip North. But yeah. that covers a huge area. That covers area. Lancashire, 101.3 million people, yeah. yeah. Mm. Now, you've written a book and your book, interesting, Lighting the Beacons. Mm. Now, tell us about the title. The beacons. Well, it's been an image that's been in my head for about 10 years. You might say vision, that sounds a bit posh. But when I was um, uh, applying for my last role, which has been director of St Melitis Northwest, I said to the panel, you know, what would it look like in 10 years time if this really flourished? And the guy interviewing me, Graham Tomlin, who some of you might know. Um, yes. Um, he said, well, when I pray for the college, I see these little lights coming on around the country, wherever our students have gone. And then it scroll forward a year and we're doing um, a half night of prayer at the college. We did them every, every term. And uh, one of the students comes to me and says, Jill, when I'm praying for the North, I see all these, these images of beacons being flanned into flame with prayer. Then the next year I was, at, we were, I was with Graham again actually marking a student presentation. When students left us, they would do a presentation of where they were going to. And uh, Ashley was going to a church in Liverpool on a uh, old beacon site and it was called, um, the school was called the Beacon School. So she played in her presentation this clip from Lord of the Rings. And it's a bit where the last part of the film, when the battle's at its worst, a little hobbit climbs up and he lights the beacon. And you see this amazing cinematography of beacons being lit across the hills. And Gandalf says, hope is kindled. And as she, uh, as she played this clip, I almost felt just massive sobs of tears because I thought this is what I've been praying for yes. all these years. And I've got almost umpteen other stories about beacons. Even yeah. to last week, I was speaking to the Bishop of Hull and she'd said, um, someone had said to her, oh, um, we're, we're praying for Hull and seeing lots of little lights coming on around the nation. So that's been a, a, key, a key story. That's the sort of the beacons. Is, yeah. So what are beacons? They're men, women and children on fire with the spirit of God. In, in my mind, sort of calling people home, showing them the route home. Yeah, absolutely.
You wrote this book for a number of different types of people. Yeah. Who's that for? OK, so when I was writing it, uh, my son said to me, you've got to write it so the rugby dads can read it. Oh, that's so, good. <laughs> so I wrote it in a really accessible way. So the rugby dads have read it, actually, or some of them have read it. Very and we had a rugby good. dad book launch. Um, and I tested drove well, on You actually had a, a rugby dad's book launch? Yes, yeah. So we went on a rugby tour. And if anybody's into rugby, you know how it's quite an important thing. It's a bit of dads and lads bonding. And so yes. I, it was Robbie's last time on the rugby tour back in March last year. So I went along and only as I turned up, I realised I was the only mum on the rugby tour with 70 other blokes. But anyway, late night, 10 o'clock at night, we, we did a rugby, rugby dad book launch. So um, thanks to Darren who introduced me. And um, yeah, so the rugby dads got it. Some of the school mums read it and helped me take out some of the sort of technical words yeah. that confuse people. Um, and one said to me, gosh, you mean, I mean, God loves me like I love my boys. I said, yes, Helen, that's how it how it is really or yes. she said this is maybe want to read the bible more so that's made me excited so that's one group but also i've got a passion really to I'm, i often find myself praying for giants of faith across in, in our in our nation across the world so when i was in primary school um as well as the pictures of jesus on the wall but um quite sadly in the 1970s we had a slow table in my class and we had the clever table I hope it's banned nowadays. But I feel like I'm on a slow table of faith. Yes. And I want to call out giants of faith. And you see giants of faith around the world and through time. And so part of what, there's quite a bit of writing of the saints in the book as well. Real giants of faith who've inspired me from the past. Um, because I'd look, I, I think God is calling out, um, you know, some of the deep spiritual inheritance we've got here in our nation, but across the world. And wanting to call out you know, you know, almost fresh fires of faith. It's also written for people who, who have also been disappointed as well, because I think sometimes when you feel like God isn't answering your prayers or he's let you down, yeah. it's almost like this cloak of despondency comes on you and you can't bear to pray another prayer, really, because God's going to let you down and it's going to get even heavier. And actually, I think there's something about... He, he, you know, in the Aesop's fable, when the sun and the wind compete... Yes. And the, the wind blows hard and harder and there's a bishop you can come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> and actually people just wrap the cloak round harder. But the sun warms the man up and he takes his cloak off. And so my prayer is also there might be people reading it who've got that cloak of despondency and the sun, as in the warmth of the spirit, warms their hearts and they find they can take off that cloak and dare to believe um, in future horizons again. Uh, you talk about the Holy Spirit quite a lot. And, and obviously that comes out of your own personal experience. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So I suppose, as you, as you know, I came to faith because the, my leader said, have you ever heard of the Holy Spirit? Yes. And he helped me, the Spirit helped me open, open my eyes as I read the Bible. But then another significant point was later as a sixth form, as a teenager, I was reading sort of Matthew 3 and thinking, what does this mean? You know where John the Baptist says, I've come to baptise with water, but one will come after me who will baptise with the Holy Spirit and fire. I was thinking, like, what on earth does that mean? Yes. You know, I was intrigued. And on, again, on a Christian holiday, that summer I was 18, and um, I've been going for a number of years, and this group of people have come back who were just more alive. They were more full of faith. They were sort of, you know, something different about them. And they talked about this thing called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so I thought, well, could, I'd love that. And so um, one of the leaders prayed for me and it was like my heart was filled with this warmth, almost fresh faith. Um, and it's got me to sort of think, I mean, the word baptise in the original Greek, although I, I, I respect your sure. knowledge. Actually, I think there's a technical word used in the yes. dyeing industry to soak a cloth. It yes. wasn't a religious yes. ceremony, was it? And actually, I think the Holy Spirit, he's wanting to soak us through, soak all the fibres of our being. And so for me, that's a repeated thing, not a one-off that, you know, some Christians have been baptised in the spirit and some haven't. I, I think, don't think it works like that. I think he longs to be baptising us all the time, I think. Absolutely, yes. Uh, what, what would you say, um, Bishop, to anyone that's listening now who's kind of thirsty for more of the Holy Spirit um, how do we access more of his spirit in our lives? Or 
are there blockages that need to be removed mm. before that happens? What would you say? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's very si simple in some ways. We can just ask. And my sense is he never disappoints our prayers. There are some blockages that can get in the way. I was quite fearful, I found, when I first heard about the Holy Spirit. Um, and so a scripture for me that became important was Romans 8, 15, where it says, I don't make you a slave to fear, yeah. but I give you the spirit of sonship. And so I, I would encourage people just simply to ask. Um, and it's often a, 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 a great, he's ever so tender with us. I think people can be um, over, you know, you can hear things about sort of, in some ways, extreme charismatic experiences that can put people off. Yes. Whereas actually he's ever so tender. And actually, as you look at the writing of the saints, sometimes the very fiery, sparkly, fireworky experiences, those are the beginner's experience. And as you get deeper in faith, I, I would suggest, or certainly Therese Ravela would suggest, that it's a sort of deeper, quieter, gentler, almost like John of the Cross talks about a glowing darkness, a way you find God. So... Um, Simply, simply ask. It's his gift. He delights to give, give us his spirit. I, I often say, uh, Bishop, that uh, Christmas is God with us. Easter is God for us. Pentecost is God in us. Oh, that's a brilliant summary. You know, and that's yes. it really. Yep. That, that we're talking about a God who is with us. Mm. He's actually for us and he wants to be in us. Yeah. And we just need to be aware, I think, of those three. Yes, that's a lovely way of putting Isn't it. it. And he delights to make his home in us. I find that incredible, really. Yeah. I know. Now, you, you're, you're a very uh, positive and optimistic bishop. <laughs> and, you know, what, what, what makes you positive and encouraging? What, what is it that you see? Um, because some people might see the world or, or see our nation and be very discouraged and very despondent. Mm. Um, but what is it about your faith in God um, that makes you positive? Yeah, well, I'll answer that with a story, really. On the, on the run-up to becoming a bishop, I went to pray in a favourite church of mine in Wales, St Paddon's Church above the hills in Aberystwyth. And um, when I... I've been there a number of times, but this time there'd just been a wedding. So the church was decorated with flowers, there's still confetti on the floor. And so I went up and knelt at the altar and it felt in my spirit like God was prompting me of, this is a bit like a wedding, Jill, your consecration as the bishop. What would you like me to give you? So I read down the wedding list, as in 1 Corinthians 14, the list of spiritual gifts, which I would recommend everybody reads. Um, and I, as I light on the gift of faith, Something in my heart warmed. I thought, Lord, I'd love the gift of faith. So whenever anybody asked me after that, well, we can pray for you, Bishop Joel, I'd say, oh, just the gift of faith. And so almost as a result of that, I've started almost seeing places and people with glimpses of the heavenly future. So I have glimpses of what the heavenly Lancaster looks like or the heavenly Blackpool or heavenly Blackburn. Um, and I'm not saying it's not, a, not like a 3D thing, but there's almost glimpses of what it will be because that will surely happen is that one day heaven will come to earth and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, that the older things will pass away. And I sometimes see that in people. And we see that in our films, actually. I think our whole film industry is predicated on this idea that one day yeah. it will all be OK. Um, and so the idea that surely one day things will... God, heaven will come to earth. That makes me positive. But also, as you look back in time, and I think it's helpful to look back over a, a long period of time. So the seventh century in the north, um, some of my, my heroes of faith, hey, Aidan. Yes. Um, he was an evangelist. Um, I'm sure he'd have been part of the... Um, oh. you're, 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 you're one of your friends if you were I'm there at the time. I'm a great fan. <laughs> he'd just bump into people on the road and say, do you know Jesus? And if they did, he'd encourage them. If they didn't, he'd ask them to come to faith anyway. So he's very much in your... Yes. In, uh, down your street. But anyway, in this, literally in a generation in the north, there was a massive flowering of mission. So I, I also believe that in a generation, there can be significant shifts, not just in faith, in a, in a society, but also in like a transformation of the society. And we can, we can live with such a narrow, short-sighted view. So one of my heroes of faith is William Wilberforce. Yeah. 
um, you know, very keen young Christian, thought that he could outlaw slavery in 18 months, you know. You know, it took him, four, I think it's 44 years. Yes. Um, but in that time, you know, London shifted. So in London of his day in, in 1792, one every, every five women, women was associated with prostitution. Um, you scroll forward 40 years and London became the banking capital of, of Europe because a gentleman's word could be his, was his bond, a very sh different shift in ethics. Um, so, so some of that, you know, he was part of this thing called the Clapham sect that they, named, they made goodness fashionable. And over that time, you see a shift in the, in the culture. And I think that's more than possible today. Yeah, you know? you're seeing signs of that. So, well, it's, isn't it interesting how the word kindness has become a key word that yes. people are talking about. Since COVID, I would say I um, I found myself talking about Jesus faster than ever in conversations. Um, and I think people have, through the, the pandemic, have encountered death and the reality of death and are, are looking for the bigger questions in life in a way, in a way which I haven't quite seen before, really. And there's an interesting data, um, as a scientist, I'm quite interested in data. Yes. So let me just give you a bit of data on this. So just after the Second World War, there was a growth in the Church of England. Yes. Now, why was that growth? Now, some of the research that the Centre of Cultural Witness have said, is it wasn't because there was great bishops or even great um, evangelists. Well, no, no, it was because of great evangelists. So it was because there was people who put the gospel in a way that other people could understand. So yes. you sort of see us, Lewis, yes. Simon Vail, T.S. Eliot, Dorothy Sayers. And um, through media as well, obviously, yes. there was very active on the radio. And there was a receptivity, wasn't there? There was a receptivity. After a national trauma, Yes. there's a receptivity of the gospel. So after a national trauma now, I am praying literally for filmmakers, for artists, for script writers, for people who can put the gospel in a way that other people can understand. And that's more than possible. So in the seventh century, you might know the story that one of Aidan's disciples, yeah. Hilda, um, she ran a mixed monastery in Whitby, and one of the people in her monastery was a cattle herder called Cademan, who was tongue-tied. He found it very difficult to get his words out. But one night he falls asleep and he hears this heavenly song. And in the morning, he not only can he hear it, he can sing it, literally. And he tells his boss, his boss tells Hilda, and Hilda gets him to sing this song at the feast. And it's basically the first example of the gospel being sung yeah. in the local Anglo-Saxon language. And I keep spotting Cademans everywhere. Like literally, sometimes it's people who are quite tongue-tied and they find they can't really express their faith very well. And then it's almost like the spirit does something in their own, in their own language and they can, like Acts 2, why does the spirit come? So that people can hear the wonders of God in their own languages. And it might not sound like J. John or, or Jill Duff when they're sure. speaking the gospel, but they'll sound, they'll, they'll reach probably networks that you or I would not reach in their own language really. Yes. So I'm praying for Cademans basically in this season and I, I believe they're out there. Amen. Bishop Jill, you are a tonic <laughs> and it's been a joy to have you on Facing the Canon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that inspired you, encouraged you, gave you a faith lift. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.